This week on What the Hell Canada, Doug Ford comes up with a new solution to Ontario's problems. Dig up! Canada's Parliament continues to descend into chaos, and not the fun kind. The BC Conservatives become increasingly unhinged, if they were ever hinged to begin with. Danielle Smith rolls out amendments to Alberta's Bill of Rights. No additional protections for people named Bill, though. Doesn't seem right. A new report lays out just how severe violence against educators is. And we have a frank talk about both sides -ing. Spoiler alert, it's bad. On both sides. But not equally. All this and more as we ask the big question on everyone's mind. What the hell, Canada? seems like Ontario Premier Doug Ford watched Die Hard 3 over the weekend and just couldn't stop thinking about tunnels. And so he decided on what will surely be one of the all-time biggest boondoggles in Ontario history. Everyone could see it coming a mile away, but that's not going to slow Doug Ford down, because if there's one thing that he's a unique and special talent for, it is wasting massive quantities of Ontarians' money. Doug Ford has come up with what is essentially a cartoon villain-level scheme. He wants to finally address all the severe traffic snarling up the 401 by simply digging another 401 immediately underneath the 401. Just dig a tunnel that is essentially going to duplicate the existing highway, but at an exponentially higher price. Expert estimates suggest that it would be somewhere in the department of $55 billion, and that is likely a low estimate. So it's essentially just going to be another 401 underground. So it's going to be like the existing highway, but way cooler. You've never heard of it. So there's a few different ways that we're going to talk about this. First up, we're going to talk about how it is an absolute bananas waste of money. Then we're going to talk about how even if they build this highway, tunnel, whatever, tunnel way, even if they build it, it's not going to solve the traffic problem. In fact, it's probably just going to make it worse, and we have a lot of evidence in history that shows this. Then we're going to talk about how Doug Ford is absolutely refusing to listen to anybody who tells him how bad of an idea this is and why he's doing it, because it's nuts. And... The whole thing's just wild. Doug Ford comes up with a lot of bad ideas, but this one is singularly unhinged. So the specifics of this tunnel to nowhere are somewhere between 30 and 100 kilometers-ish underneath the 401. And he thinks that this is going to ease traffic on the road since the highway is one of the busiest in the world. And yeah, traffic is a serious concern there. The average Toronto area commuter spends 98 hours each year in rush hour traffic. And the idea is that by tunneling out underneath the 401, they're going to be able to follow the existing route without disrupting any of the services on the surface. But we all know that's not how it's actually going to play out. But don't worry, Doug Ford insists that none of the obvious problems that have played out with every tunnel project he's ever been a part of will ever affect this. Even though this would be the longest road tunnel in the world by a significant margin. And if you're wondering how expensive it'll be, I'm sure Doug Ford is wondering that too. Because he has no cost estimate, no timeline estimate. And while he's announced a feasibility study, it's not looking at whether or not it's feasible, it's just looking at the length of the tunnel. The tunnel's basically already decided, it appears. So they're going to look at lengths and costs in order to address what Doug Ford claims is $11 billion of cost that traffic has for the economy each year. And he's out to lunch for a bunch of reasons. For starters, his ideas about this project are impossibly optimistic. He claimed it wouldn't cost billions. And he also said that there was no risk of a long timeline or delays, simply because they're good at digging tunnels. Which is absolutely not true! The Line 5 expansion of the Toronto subway was approved as part of the 1985 network plan, and it was scheduled to be done by 2003. Still not open. Like, actual construction began in earnest in 2010 when Metrolinx bought four boring machines, but the train still isn't running. But we're good at tunnels. Don't worry about the fact that Doug Ford wants to dig the biggest road tunnel in the world. I'm sure it won't have any obvious cost overruns or delays, and definitely won't flip money to anybody with direct connections to him. Unrelated, but that Line 5 project? Already $13 billion deep, and no trains running. This is such an obvious recipe for disaster. And there is a very easy way that Doug Ford could relieve some of the congestion on the 401, and he's just going to ignore it because it doesn't enrich any of his beneficiaries. You see, Canada has exactly one toll highway. We have toll bridges, but only one toll highway. And that is the 407. It was completed in 2001, and it was originally planned as just an entirely ordinary public highway. But because the Conservative government ran out of money, they decided to exercise their favorite approach, short-term thinking, in order to balance the books on the backs of the future. In this case, they leased out a segment of the 401 on a 99-year lease for $3.1 billion, and they turned it into a toll highway. And since the first segments added tolls in 1999, they brought in over $17 billion in revenue. So to recap, they built a highway for a billion and a half dollars, leased out a segment of it for 99 years for $3.1 billion, and then Ontarians went on to pay $17 billion additional dollars in tolls. What a great value! 
And to give you a sense of just how badly Ontarians have lost out here, in 2019, SNC-Lavalin sold a 10% stake of that highway for $3.25 billion, suggesting that the total value is $32.5 billion. Ah yes, conservatives, the party of fiscal responsibility, so long as you don't pay any attention to numbers or facts. Weird how that whole project seemed to just make the already wealthy far wealthier and cost ordinary Ontarians lots of money. So they could alleviate a lot of this traffic by simply buying back the 407 and removing the tolls. That could be done probably a lot cheaper than digging a massive tunnel to nowhere. I was just gonna dig another highway underground this time. And because of the high tolls, the 407 is often very quiet. If the government simply bought back the 407 and removed the tolls, a lot of the traffic going into Toronto would be alleviated. But instead, they're gonna dig a tunnel to nowhere. Which, honestly, would be a pretty good title for Doug Ford's biography. That or failing upwards. And even if they do build the highway, it's not gonna fix anything. You see, there's a concept called induced demand that's really important here. And this has been studied again and again. Like, you can tell me just one more lane, bro, in the comments all you like. But the research is incredibly clear. For every 10% increase in metropolitan lane miles, traffic increases 3-6% to in the first few years, and 6-10% to in the following 5-10. to This means if you build a road or a highway or whatever, you're going to have to build more lanes before the life of that road or highway is complete. And you're just always going to have to expand. And it makes sense when you think about it, because we've been building more and more lanes and roads and highways for a hundred years now, and it hasn't ended traffic. And this happens so often. Cities forecast the demand, they build the roads to the demand, and then when they build those roads to the demand, it increases the demand, leading to severe traffic. And this bears out in the example that we can look at that would be most similar to this project, the Big Dig in Boston. Average drivers in that region lost 88 hours to traffic last year, which isn't much better than Toronto. And the Big Dig cost tens of billions of dollars and ran massively over budget and over time. And after all that, it didn't even alleviate traffic. And it's like Doug Ford almost immediately forgot the fact that Toronto was underwater as recently as mid-August. Many of the tunnels in the city flooded. I'm sure a whole sequence of underground tunnels dug by Doug Ford would never ever flood, except for all the tunnels that have flooded previously. But we're good at tunnels, assuming you have a short memory. And the mechanism that induced demand works by is pretty straightforward. You build a bunch more roads to alleviate congestion so people realize that there's less congestion. So they start taking the road more, maybe they plan more stops, maybe they're willing to live a little further away from the workplace because the highway's not so busy, and it's not that long to drive. But these problems don't happen individually, they happen at scale. And so what happens is that demand gets induced. More people, more cars, more stops, more traffic. But we also need to think about what the bottlenecks here are. Where are all these cars getting held up? It's when they go into the city. Maybe it's to work, maybe it's to run errands, maybe it's whatever. Maybe they're shipping goods. But in any case, they're often going into Toronto. And the inlets to the city can only process so many people at one time. And that's what this graphic illustrates. So how do we address that bottleneck? Adding another highway is just going to make more cars get snarled up in traffic on the way into the city. And so this graphic shows what the answer is. Options. Things like buses and bike lanes and trains. And not just eliminating lanes or highways, but creating alternatives. That way, people who still want to drive can drive and there's way more open road available for them. And the people who don't want to drive will still have viable alternatives that will help them to reduce the actual load on the roads. And if you don't think that induced demand is a thing, I have a very simple challenge. Offer a single example of a time we're building more roads, or adding more lanes, alleviated traffic long term. Any example? It just doesn't exist. Induced demand is long-held research. We know this happens. Cities have just chosen to ignore it for a long time because the actual answers to traffic are more complicated and often require us rethinking our approach instead of just saying one more lane bro. Systemic issues are hard to address. It's a lot easier just to pay you. Which brings us to one more question. Why is Doug Ford producing such an obvious bad idea? He knows this won't work. He knows this won't solve traffic. So why is he doing it? And the answer is one of the conservative go-to strategies. And we talked about this strategy on this channel in the past. It's called a dead cat. Not my term. Sorry about that. The term was coined by former London mayor and UK prime minister slash birthday clown Boris Johnson. And I'm just reading you the quote because he actually puts it pretty well. Broken clock twice a day. You know how it is. Quote, there is one thing that is absolutely certain about throwing a dead cat on the dining room table. And I don't mean that people will be outraged, alarmed, disgusted. That is true, but irrelevant. The key point, says my Australian friend, is that everyone will shout, geez, mate, there's a dead cat on the table. In other words, they will be talking about the dead cat, the thing you want them to talk about, and they will not be talking about the issue that has been causing you so much grief. And this is exactly what's happening. Doug Ford's failing on so many fronts and facing so many different attacks that he just wants to get everybody focused on this goofy project. His base will love it, genuinely, because they believe that more lanes will fix traffic. That's why he wants to get rid of bike lanes, because he thinks that somehow getting people out of cars doesn't relieve traffic. 
he's a little confused. But the heart of this is a distraction from his failures on housing. Ontario hasn't met demand growth for 27 months in a row. They are nowhere near their housing targets. The gap between housing construction and population growth is the widest that it's been in 50 years. But we're going to tie up mounds of construction workers on his Mole Man project. Housing starts haven't been anywhere near meeting demand, and it's only getting worse. And Ontario's plan to build 1.5 million homes is not even close to in sight. They're supposed to build a million and a half homes by 2031. They lowered their target last year and still didn't make it, and they're not even going to get close to their target this year. Funny thing about governments announcing their targets, they never, ever hit them. But we should trust Doug Ford to build a gigantic tunnel. I'm sure it'll go fine. This is a distraction. It's meant to distract from Doug Ford's many ongoing failures, and it's meant to get you focused on this astonishingly bad idea and not his astonishingly bad leadership. I mean, this is a bad idea too, but keeping up with all of Doug Ford's bad ideas requires a lot of plate spinning. We need to talk about the BC Conservatives because they are in the midst of an election that they might win, and that is terrifying. This is an entire party that has embraced the most unhinged parts of the far right, and there is a very real risk they could govern. And there are very serious policy concerns that I'm going to talk about in an upcoming BC election special, but today we're going to talk about the party and their character in general, because they are filled from top to bottom with absolute lunatics who should not be trusted anywhere near the power of government. And the rod begins at the head. First up, party leader John Rustad. And I don't even know where to start here. Maybe it's his attacks on trans and non-binary youth, including his attacks on the SOGI resources, attacks on trans healthcare, including outright lies about it, and more. In a speech at the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade, Rustad said, quote, A doctor I was talking to just last week, he's a specialist in spinal and neck injuries, a specialist surgeon. He gets two days every two months at the facility he's working at. That's it. That's all the time he's been allocated. One of his colleagues gets 12 days a month for doing gender-affirming surgeries. We can do better, folks. We can figure out how to make sure that our professionals have the ability to go and provide the services that we need in British Columbia. And that is a ridiculous and entirely false claim. The Taiyi fact-checked this, and it's not even close to true. In BC, 0.44% of people identify as trans or non-binary. And in BC in 2023, there were 4,035 spinal surgeries performed and 115 gender-affirming surgeries total in a year. It is just an outright lie. He's also called homosexuality a lifestyle, implying that it's a choice. And he's followed the same messaging around parents' rights that was brought forward in Saskatchewan and New Brunswick and is coming up in Alberta. You can be confident that a pronoun policy will be coming out in BC if the Conservatives get elected. His party also brought forward a bill to end provincial funding to sports organizations that don't classify participants by biological sex. Now, this was voted down because it was obviously discriminatory for a bunch of different reasons, and we're not going to argue about trans sport today. But this would have excluded something as simple as a co-ed sport. Like, John Brewstead is a small, hateful man. He compared the teaching of sexuality and gender in schools to residential schools. He literally used the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation for a cheap shot, posting this, quote, Today is National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, or Orange Shirt Day. Today we remember what happens when the Canadian government thinks it's better at raising children than parents. I will always stand with my parents. Now, he insisted that was an innocuous comment, but given the context of the arguments about the SOGI program, it was pretty obvious what was happening. And he embraces bananas conspiracy theories all the time. He doesn't seem interested in evidence or reality, he'll just believe anything he sees on the internet. Most recently, Press Progress found him repeating a conspiracy theory about eating bugs. Just watch this clip. They're limiting the number of cattle that they can have on their farms. And just, just about a year or two ago now, the new plant was built in uh, Ontario, I think in the Ottawa area. This plant produces 40,000 tons of bug protein for human and animal consumption. 40,000 tons of bug. And there's a second plant that's now in the process of being built. This is what they think is the solution. And I can tell you, stopping cows from farting and belching is not going to change the weather. But I tell you what it will do. It'll destroy our quality of life. And there's a bunch more of this thing. He talks about the convoy in 15-minute cities and goes into the weeds on conspiracy theories. And before you come into my comments explaining to me the bug thing's real, no, it isn't. 90% of the cricket protein produced in that plant that this guy is talking about is for pet consumption. It's just livestock and pets. 
The other 10% is for human consumption, yes, but nobody's forcing you to eat it. Like, you can buy bags of cricket protein in the store, but they usually use a supplement for people who want powdered protein but are allergic to something like whey or just don't want it. I've tried it. It's terrible. It's like drinking sand. Some people like it. I don't, I'm not here to judge. But nobody's forcing you to eat crickets. Like, do you think you just go to the grocery store and they pin you down and feed you crickets? Everybody knows that only happens at Loblaw stores. But that's not going to stop John Rustad from claiming that the government is going to force you to eat crickets. Let's hear him go on a little more about conspiracy theories, shall we? It takes away our freedoms. And so that's why when I saw the trucker convoy, and I thought about where we need to be and what they stood for and those values that they took across this country and the, the flag that was raised around the world, my hat's off to, to those people, those people that took that initiative because those are values that we need to fight for. We should not be expecting our kids to eat bugs. We should not be expecting our kids to not be able to afford a reasonable quality of life. We should not be expecting people in the world to be starving simply because we're trying to meet some sort of ideology. So he's a big Convoy fan, and that's not like an old clip, it's from 2023. He's also doing the standard Trump-style move of claiming that election rules are rigged just in case he loses, so he can blame someone. But I want to revisit the bug thing for just one second, because BC is winding up having an oddly bug-themed election. You see, this week, NDP leader David Eby was giving a speech when this happened. Doing this, uh, we've supported TransLink with $800 million over the last... That was a bug. <laughs> <laughs> It was a B. <laughs> I'm fine. And I do want to take a moment to highlight this absolutely amazing photo from Daryl Dick, who captured the wasp the moment before it stung David Eby. It saw its moment and it took it. And you might be thinking, why is Steve bringing this up? Aside from the fact that it's a pretty funny clip. But if I just want to show you funny clips, I'd show you this one of Doug Ford eating a bee. Sector. <laughs> Holy Christ. I just swallowed a bee. Oh my Holy Christ. I knew that little bugger. Oh. This is going to be replayed over and over again. And that just made Colin DeMello's day. He's going to be laughing all the way back to the sea. Holy Christ, he's, he's wedged in my throat. Sorry, guys. A little bugger got away in there. Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm okay. He's buzzing in there. See, that clip would only be tangentially related, and I'd only show it to you if I thought it was really funny. Imagine. And David Eby used the opportunity of getting stung by a wasp to have a bit of a laugh. He quote tweeted a photo of the wasp in question and said, quote, I want to reassure everyone that I'm fine. And I promised John Rustad that with three hungry kids at home, this bug will not go to waste. And that is genuinely hilarious. A-plus politician bird. And John Rustad got mad, saying, quote, David Eby and the NDP are desperate to keep talking about COVID and bugs. They want an unserious election because they have failed BC families on everything that matters. Life in BC is unaffordable, healthcare is unavailable, housing is unobtainable, and our communities are unsafe. So we're just not going to talk about the bug thing then? Also, stick around to the end of the segment and I will read you the single funniest political statement that I've read in my entire life. David Eby's camp sent it out in an email shortly after, and honestly, it's worth it. But if you think the madness of the BC Conservatives is limited to their leader, then clearly you don't know about their executive director. So most of this information comes from what's called an oppo file, an opposition research file. BC United had an oppo file in the executive director of the Conservative Party of British Columbia, Angelo Isidoru. And it's not flattering. So the file was provided to the Canadian press and Press Progress has gotten their hands on the full file. And it includes things like a photo of Isidoru at a protest wearing a Make America Great Again hat and giving what appears to be a white power gesture. He insists that it isn't, but it very likely is as it's a generally recognized symbol of hate by the Anti-Defamation League. But I'll leave it up to you, because I don't want to get sued. Although when he was asked, he jumped straight into whataboutisms, saying, quote, It's interesting when you see that Barack Obama and Justin Trudeau and Kamala Harris and so many others made the same symbol, but nobody asked them that question. Yeah, huh? Sure thing, bud. But that's far from all there was in there. In 2018, he was a member of the PPC, although he said he left following racism and extremism from the party. The file also contained claims that he was a big fan of Lauren Southern, who's been tied up in that tenant media stuff. And it was also packed with a bunch of very questionable screenshots from his social media. Not a guy with great vibes. Gives big uncle you don't want to talk to with Thanksgiving vibes. But the rod in the Conservative Party of BC goes all the way through. Their internal politics are full of shenanigans. And some of their candidates are truly unhinged. At least one constituency association president has resigned because of the top-down nature of the nomination process for candidates. 
although they wouldn't get into any detail because they had signed an NDA, which is nuts. Why is a party official signing a non-disclosure agreement on party processes? That is incredibly shady. And if that wasn't shady enough, one candidate, Alexander Wright, was running for the Conservatives in Kelowna Mission. Then she got a text from John Rustad asking to get together, and when they got together, he just told her she wouldn't be running anymore. He asked her to run in Vernon Lundy to make room for former BC Liberal leadership candidate Gavin Dew. She was offered $20,000 in her riding if she were to move. She said it was phrased as, quote, money to make up for my inconveniences of having to start again. It was an incentive. And before you think this must be illegal, unfortunately, it isn't. Elections BC has already weighed in saying that the Elections Act doesn't prohibit a party from offering a monetary transfer to a candidate as an incentive. There are shockingly few restrictions on how you can spend party funds, unfortunately. And I'm just going to take you a moment to read this statement from a conservative candidate. Dupinder Kaur Saram. I'm just going to read it to you verbatim. Quote, Effective today, I'm withdrawing my name from the ballot for the 2024 BC election campaign. I recently removed myself as a BC conservative candidate following John Rustad's secret deal with Kevin Falcon. At that time, I now say I would run as an independent candidate. I'm very disappointed with how the Conservative Party of BC has handled this entire process and I feel disrespected as a racialized candidate. However, the weakness of John Rousset has also been made clear to me. Before I became an independent candidate, there were hateful anti-seat posts circulating and Rousset's BC Conservative Party refused to defend and support me. It has become clear that I was used as a brown token for the party to serve their purpose of attracting Sikh and minority supporters and then easily cast aside. Another BC Conservative position that made me realize that they do not support me was that they were actively considering bringing back the RCMP in Surrey if they are elected. I do not think the people of Surrey want to bring back this old debate that has gone on far too long. For years, I have worked to establish strong relationships in my community. My supporters encourage me to continue representing them as an independent, but we cannot run the risk of John Rustad's candidate being elected in this riding. I no longer believe that the Conservative Party of BC holds the values that they pretend to. If they can't stand up for their candidates, how can they stand up for Surrey? I want to endorse and throw all of my support behind Ginny Sims, the BC NDP Surrey's panorama candidate and incumbent. As one South Asian woman to another, I will support Ginny in whichever way possible. With myself as a registered nurse and Jimmy as a retired teacher, together we can support Surrey's healthcare and education needs to benefit our community. That is about as damning a message you can get from a former candidate as I can imagine. But they've also removed some wild candidates, like Rachel Weber. She was a candidate for Prince George Mackenzie until the party finally decided to remove her after she claimed that 5G was some sort of weapon. Another candidate, who's still a candidate, has made an absolutely appalling claim comparing gun control to Japanese internment. Just watch this clip. It's the biggest property grab by a, a government using order in council since they took away the property of the Japanese in 1942. It, it's, it's, it's as big as that or bigger. And it's based on targeting a minority, us, and it's based on a purely ideological war against our culture. That's what this is. But I want to take a second to go through this thread that was put out by an NDP candidate named Ravi Parmar because he assembled a mega thread of conspiracy theory posts from BC Conservative candidates, and there are a lot. This is another candidate, Chris Sankey, claiming that the January 6 riots were a conspiracy. Another, Brian Tepper, claiming that January 6 was a lie. Another who claimed that CNN pushed a fake narrative about January 6 and that the writers were Antifa dressed up as Trump supporters. Ah, yes, Antifa. Always Antifa. And Jordan Corey claiming that the Democrats cheated in the 2020 election and that Hillary Clinton should be indicted. Karen Hartwell claims that the Democrats cheated and Trump won in 2020. Or you have Brian Burgo, who liked a post saying that whiteness is awesome. Made a bunch of weird comments about breastfeeding. Complained about a pride flag on a fire truck because he's threatened by colors. Claimed that, quote, indigenous people commit more crime, like black people in the U.S. He apologized for that statement, but still, yikes. The BC conservatives are absolutely full to the brim with maniacs. This is a party where the clowns have taken over the circus. This is the people who were all far too radical for BC liberals who coalesced around absolute lunacy. There isn't anything that goes with that ideology. They'll believe anything but the truth, and they need to be stopped. And now, as promised, the absolutely bananagrams email that the BC NDP sent out shortly after the WASP attack. Quote, EB gets tough on bugs as Roostad bumbles questions about bizarre views. One day after a video circulated of John Roostad declaring the kids should not be forced to eat bugs, it's David EB who's getting tough on insects. At a campaign event swarming with excitement, EB swatted down on an aggressive WASP that was determined to become a fly in the ointment of an important announcement about new trades apprenticeship spaces. David would never let a wasp sting bug him enough to stop such an important commitment to people, said NDP campaign <laughs> director Marie Della Mattia. He is beelining to more training and good-paying jobs for British Columbians. Meanwhile, John Rustad decided to flee reporters for the second straight day. Yet again, we've heard crickets from John Rustad, said Delio Mattia. 
It looks like his tendency to fly off the handle on bizarre conspiracy theories is causing his handlers to wrap him in a protective cocoon. On Monday and Tuesday, Rustad repeatedly refused to answer direct questions about his unbelievable conspiracy theories. He might as well have told them to buzz off, said Della Mattia. When it comes to talking to conspiracy theorists on the internet, John Rustad is quite the chatterbug, said Della Mattia. But since he's running for premier, he should stop winging it and making up weird theories on the fly. He should give British Columbians some straight answers about the creepy, crawly, scary things that he believes. Della Mattia suspects that a fly on the wall of Rustad's campaign would gain insight into his real plans to sting regular British Columbians with higher costs, cancelled projects, and cuts to healthcare. It seems that for John Rustad, listening to scientists and experts is a no-fly zone, says Della Mattia. And his record shows that he won't hesitate to mothball David E.B.'s actions to deliver better healthcare in homes people can afford. Whichever staffer wrote that email, you are putting that English degree to good use. Well done. Canadian Parliament is a disaster, even more than usual. It has declined into a new terrible level of chaos, and there are different reasons for it, but first and foremost is the Conservative Party of Canada. They have absolutely disgraced the House in every way they can think of. If you've ever watched a question period, you know it can get contentious and loud and obnoxious, but the Conservatives have made it so much worse. It has become an absolute nightmare of endless sloganeering. It feels like it's stuck on repeat. Literally every conservative question starts with the same slogans and ends with the same slogans. I've been streaming Question Period on Twitch, and we do Question Period bingo because the repeats are so predictable. It is incredibly obnoxious and pointless. QP, not the stream. Maybe the stream. Depends on who you ask. And then you get folks like NDP MP Blake Desjarlais, who stands up and asks a pointed, insightful question, and the liberals sidestep it entirely. And you realize why this whole thing has descended into nothingness. There are no questions asked, and when they are, no answers are given. And the reasons for this are deep and complicated, and we're going to get into it in a few minutes, but first I want to show you just a few examples. Like, you may already know that MP Garnet Genouy had yelled a homophobic statement, as did MP Michael Barrett. They're both in the official Hansard. They were talking about the bathtub in the Canadian Consul General's apartment in New York, which is a petty thing to be fighting about to begin with. We was shouting about Justin Trudeau and Tom Clark, the UN Consul General, saying, quote, does he engage with them in the bathtub? And then Michael Barrett said, quote, did Tom get the top bunk? making a very obvious sexual implication about Justin Trudeau and Tom Clark. Well, Garnet Genouy was given a chance to apologize, and this is what he had to say. I am just going to play the remarks in their entirety because it is humiliating. Mr. Speaker, I, I just want to say briefly that as members know, the NDP whip in particular has a history of making false and defamatory comments about me, and this is no exception. It's very clear... <laughs> Colleagues, if you please can keep your comments to yourself so that the chair can listen to this point of order being raised by the member from Sherwood Park for Saskatchewan who, who was referenced in some other point of orders. I think it is fair to allow him to raise his point of order uninterrupted to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There was an exchange yesterday in question period about extravagant spending by the government. Nine million dollars spent on a luxury condo on Billionaire's Row. Now, the Leader of the Opposition asked a question... Speaker, I can't hear him. I can't hear him, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker I can't hear him. false or defamatory comments have been made about me. If members want to hear a response, I'll provide a response. The Leader of the Opposition pointed out $9 million spent on this extravagant condo and identified a number of luxury features associated with that condo, including an extremely luxurious bathtub. Following that, the Prime Minister made no comment whatsoever about those features. Instead, the Prime Minister uh, spoke about the kinds of international engagement that the government does. And as the Hansard clearly... Um, so, colleagues, 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 I'm going to ask the Honourable Member, uh, please, if, if... I'm going to ask... I'm going to ask the Honourable Member please to get to his point because it's very important that we try to get to the point so that it's not perceived as engaging in debate. I'm trying to make sure. Mr. Speaker, false and defamatory comments have been made about me. Yep. I'm providing a response and, and hopefully members will, will benefit from reviewing the context of what happened. Yep. Nine million dollars were spent on a luxury condo on Billionaire's Row in New York. In a question from the Leader of the Opposition, various luxury... Okay, colleagues, if we, if a member is, if the member has been... 
colleagues. So I'm going to invite the uh, I, I'm going to invite the honourable member from for, uh, from Sherwood Park Forest, Saskatchewan. He was almost there. I'd ask him, please, just immediately get to the point so that uh, we can address the allegations which were made against the honourable member, and then we can move on in the house. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we've heard a few words said in this House about bullying. I'm trying to provide an explanation with context and to answer false allegations that have been made against me, and I will persist in, in, in doing that. So following questions from the Leader of the Opposition about a $9 million luxury condo purchased by the government, and in particular identifying among the features of that condo a luxury bathtub, the, the Prime Minister ignored reference to those features and instead spoke about the engagement done by the government internationally. And the Hansard shows the exchange. And many of the comments about, uh, uh, made on Twitter about what was allegedly said don't reflect what's in the Hansard. The Hansard notes, does he engage with them in the bathtub? The point of that comment is to illustrate that, of course, meetings don't take place in a bathtub. Luxury, a luxurious bathtub has nothing to do with meetings. The Prime Minister's answer had nothing to do with the questions, but it had nothing to do with sex. I wasn't thinking about sex at all. If you find yourself at any point standing in the middle of a parliament screaming, I wasn't thinking about sex, things are not going well for you. I want to be really clear about that. But don't worry, the conservatives were far more concerned about Justin Trudeau's use of the word crap. How dare he? But the sloganary has gotten pathetic. The conservatives brought forward a non-confidence motion and that failed thoroughly. So do you know what they did? They immediately brought forward another non-confidence motion. So the wording of the first motion was this, quote, that the House has no confidence in the prime minister and the government. That was it. Failed completely. So now they move down to the second one that is just all of their slogans. It reads, quote, that given that after nine years the government has doubled housing costs, taxed food, punished work, unleashed crime, and is the most centralizing government in Canadian history, the House has lost confidence in the government and offers Canadians the option to axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime. So to recap, that is nine slogans in one sentence. That is a level of sloganeering that is previously unheard of. They've really stepped up their game. And the reason why they keep getting away with this garbage is twofold. First, most Canadians just don't watch Parliament very much. As a result, they don't really know about the absolute nonsense that gets played out on the national stage daily. Subscribe below. But also, Speaker Greg Fergus is absolutely failing miserably. There has been point of order after point of order this session because he's failing to properly enforce rules. If you've been watching my channel lately, you've seen multiple clips of multiple minutes of him just muting the mic and watching the house and standing there and looking sternly disappointed. Or gently saying, order, order. He asks again and again for people to ask questions seeking information and stop making personal attacks. They don't, and nothing happens. He asks people not to interrupt, and nothing happens. There's never any consequence, and when there is a consequence, it is nothing. Do you remember last week where Pierre Poiliev called Jagmeet saying a fake, a phony, and a fraud, all of which are against the rules, and Jagmeet rose and yelled, I'm right here, bro? The speaker reviewed the tape and requested that both sides apologize, withdraw their statements, and promise not to act that way in the future. Fergus described the quality of statements of Poiliev as excessively scornful and personal. Fergus told them both to withdraw and apologize. Singh did so. Poiliev did not. Didn't respond at all. So in that moment, what Greg Fergus should have done is ruled Poiliev out of order. That means he can't participate until he follows the rules. Instead, Greg Fergus removed three questions from the Conservatives during question period. Poiliev should have been found out of order and should have been held out of order until he withdrew and apologized. The fact that he was able to get away with this with no apology or real consequence and nothing was done except losing three questions during question period 
is about as minor as this could have been. This is seriously undermining Greg Ferguson's credibility as a speaker. He has lost control of the House, lost control of the conservatives, and he needs to either step up or step down because this is embarrassing. National disgrace is playing out in front of our eyes, and it's only going to continue to get worse as the conservatives try to bring down this minority parliament. And we need a speaker with the courage who actually stand up to Pierre Poilievre instead of just letting him run over parliament. Because the sloganeering is nonstop. Just watch this supercut of Pierre Poilievre from just this week repeating himself. It is painful. Like ...of the official opposition. Mr. Speaker, he who could be against the following motion, that given that for nine years the government has doubled housing costs, taxed food, punished work, unleashed crime, and is the most centralizing government in Canadian history, the House has lost confidence in the government and offers Canadians the option to axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime. Well, at least someone over there thinks about monetary policy. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, who could be against the following motion? That, given that, after nine years, the government has doubled housing costs, taxed food, punished work, unleashed crime, and is the most centralizing government in Canadian history, the House has lost confidence in the government and offers Canadians the option to axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime. The Honourable Leader of the Government... So ago, I asked the government who could be against a motion pointing out that this government's doubled housing costs, tax food, punish work, and unleash crime to give Canadians the chance to axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime. And she said... Canadians are against all of those things. <laughs> if that's the case, then why won't she let them decide in a carbon tax yeah. election now? <laughs> I don't care which side of the house you sit on. That's embarrassing. We all need to expect better from our politicians. This week on Favorite Political Moments, we're going to the U.S. Now, I want to be really clear. I am not weighing in on anything that happened in the UN. We're just having a giggle at a silly moment. Because we're going to look at the president of Haiti, Edgar LeBlanc Fit. He was speaking to the UN General Assembly and availing himself pretty well when he decided that he needed a cold beverage. And clearly, he was immensely thirsty. Just watch. Respect. Res respect for its dignity. And so let's cut the guy a little slack. He was speaking for the first time in front of the UN General Assembly. He was probably very nervous and didn't think to grab a glass. At the end of the speech, he did drink out of his glass and had a little laugh about it. But the UN could be a pretty tense place, so a silly moment can be worth enjoying. One more time for the road. Respect. Res respect for its dignity and... Delight. The Alberta UCP government continues to fly off the rails, further by the day. This time it's Danielle Smith taking to her personal YouTube channel to share her outline for the Alberta Bill of Rights. It's all part of a larger plan to consolidate power and support within her base in order to survive what's likely to be an extremely contentious leadership review in November. But we'll come back to that later. Before we go any further here, we do need a bit of context. Alberta already has a Bill of Rights, but it's almost entirely decorative. It was brought forward in 2000, and it has some weird stuff in it. For starters, preamble's gonna make your toes curl. Whereas the free and democratic society existing in Alberta is founded on principles that acknowledge the supremacy of God and on principles fostered by tradition that honor and respect human rights and fundamental freedoms and the dignity and worth of the human person. So straight to the religious stuff right out of the gates, which will give you a strong sense of what this document is like, because it is very American and it is also mostly decorative. It's just for show. First off, the rights. The rights currently listed in the Alberta Bill of Rights are the right of the individual to liberty, security of the person, and enjoyment of property, and the right to not be deprived thereof except by due process of law, the right of the individual to equality before the law and protection of the law, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly and association, freedom of the press, and the right of parents to make informed decisions respecting the education of their children. And that's the extent of it at present. So a couple of important things. First up, every single one of these currently covered by the existing Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Nothing that can be written at a provincial level 
supersedes that. So this is basically a loud declaration of rights that already exist, but in a format that much more closely resembles the American Bill of Rights. But worth noting, everything in here is kind of optional. In the law, it says, quote, every law of Alberta shall, unless it is expressly declared by an act of the legislature that it operates notwithstanding the Alberta Bill of Rights, be so construed and applied as to not abrogate, abridge, or infringe, or to authorize the abrogation, abridgment, or infringement of any of the rights or freedoms herein recognized and declared. What that means is if they bust out the notwithstanding clause, this whole thing could just be hand-waved away. So there's really nothing protecting it here. They could just use the notwithstanding clause to get rid of this whenever they want. But Danielle Smith took to YouTube to announce her plans to add three new rights to the Alberta Bill of Rights. At least. It might be more, we don't know. And we don't know the specific wordings yet, I'll show you some possibilities later. But she specifically pointed to the right to refuse medical treatment without consent or something along those lines, specifically an anti-vax provision, that would prevent the government from mandating basically any sort of vaccination. It would also extend potentially to things like masking as well. Although worth noting, if they actually do add that to the Alberta Bill of Rights, it would make Danielle Smith's plan to do forced addiction treatments illegal. So it's very possible that she's going to have to use the notwithstanding clause to withhold a right immediately after granting that right. Danielle Smith also talked about the, quote, right of individuals to legally acquire, keep, and safely use firearms, which is concerningly wide-ranging. But it's important to note, provincial law cannot surpass federal law. Whatever provincial laws may or may not pass about firearms cannot go past federal law. Doesn't work like that, no matter how badly they want it to. The third proposal that she talked about was about property seizure, basically saying it's your right not to be deprived of your property without due process of law and fair compensation, which takes away the ability of the government to seize property. And there are some huge issues with this. Like, for starters, it would take away the ability to impound the vehicles of drunk drivers. Just as a start. But if you had organizations operating legally, they could potentially keep doing so for years without any seizure of their property while they dragged out the process. There are some serious risks to this. Danielle Smith doesn't seem to have a plan for any of them. And it's really unclear just how far this is going to go. At the UCP general meeting, they passed a list of rights, and it contains 21. This was signed off on by the UCB board, and we're going to go through them real quick, because I think you should hear them. This is the actual wording from the UCP draft policy, approved by the provincial board. Freedom of religion, belief, and conscience, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, freedom of speech, expression, and from private or public censorship in any form, freedom of parents to make decisions concerning the health, education, welfare, and upbringing of their children, freedom to keep and bear arms, including ownership and use of firearms, freedom to keep and own private property, including land, livestock, and chattels, freedom of mobility, including to enter, to remain, to move about, to leave, and to return to Alberta, freedom to remain silent under questioning, detention, arrest, or a trial, freedom to consult legal counsel and to be properly informed of such right, freedom to demand natural justice and procedural fairness in all criminal and civil matters and to demand compensation for denial or infringement of rights by a person, a corporation, or a government, freedom from arbitrary detention to be presumed innocent in criminal proceedings, to be provided with full crown disclosure and to be tried within a reasonable time, freedom to democratically elect and recall legislators by voting through secret paper ballots to be manually hand-counted, freedom to use sufficient Force to defend person, family, home, and property from any and all occupation, theft, and destruction. Freedom of informed consent and to make personal health decisions, including to refuse vaccinations, medical, or surgical procedures. Freedom to peacefully assemble, associate, and protest. Freedom from excessive taxation and from taxation without representation. Freedom from discrimination, including upon the basis of diversity, inclusion, and equity. Freedom of access to financial services, to goods and services, and to conduct commerce via bills of exchange. Freedom to demand independent public inquiry into the conduct of legislatures, judges, and other government-appointed officials. And freedom to access government services and government information. So many of these are bonkers. For example, freedom from supervision and surveillance is wild. Like, does that mean security cameras are illegal? What if your front doorbell's got a ring on it? It also has a stand your ground right. Like the freedom to use sufficient force to defend a person's family, home, and property. What does that mean? People are gonna start killing other people? Like if you go onto a farmer's property, will they have the right to shoot you? And how about freedom from discrimination, including on the basis of diversity, equity, or inclusion? What does that mean? That is incredibly sweeping, incredibly concerning. Albertans should be terrified of this. The Alberta government's about to massively overhaul many of the fundamental laws of the land with no thought to how it'll impact the operations of the province, the government, the people, 
businesses, anything. And I want to be really clear here. I'm not automatically against the expansion of rights, but we need to be very careful about the implications of expanding rights and what that brings with it, especially at a provincial level. These aren't real rights. This isn't really how rights work in Canadian law. But when the expansion of rights is specifically designed to cater to the most extreme parts of her base, that should worry everybody. Because this is basically importing the American Bill of Rights with some extra stuff to cater to anti-vaxxers. And that brings us to the why. Danielle Smith has a leadership review coming up in November, and you may remember that her predecessor, Jason Kenney, didn't survive a leadership review. Well, he kind of did, but he survived it with a really narrow margin, so he had no mandate to govern and stepped down. Also, you may remember that he warned us that things were about to get much, much worse, and that he'd been holding the far more extreme wings of the party in check. And I never thought I'd say this, but Jason Kenney was right. Turns out he was the lesser of two evils. Who knew? So Danielle Smith's trying to gather support, in particular from the people who show up at the meetings. And that would be exactly the people who passed this Alberta Bill of Rights at the UCP AGM. She's just trying to sway votes, but she's also trying to restrict who can vote. Because it wouldn't be the UCP if it wasn't anti-democratic. You see, in the run-up to a leadership review, there are often a bunch of people who try to sign up for the party in order to get a vote. Many times because they're frustrated and they want a voice to push for a change in the leadership. And typically, parties just required you to be a member for a set amount of time in order to have a vote in the leadership review. Generally, party membership's quite open. You'll usually have to declare that you're not a member of any other parties, but that's usually about it. And for this leadership review, the UCP has actually started vetting applicants to become members. At least two prominent Albertans, Nate Pike from the Breakdown AB and Thomas Sukazik, the former deputy premier, both got rejected by the UCP as potential members. And it's entirely on the basis of just their political positions, their affiliations with the NDP. And they accused Thomas Lukasik of impropriety around phone bills that he'd been found innocent of like a decade ago. But that doesn't slow down the UCP. So Danielle Smith's overhauling the Alberta legal system in an attempt to shore up her base and restricting who can become a member of the party in order to protect her leadership. And real quick, I want to shout out Disordered YYC on Twitter, who is the absolute greatest at finding clips. In this case, it's Danielle Smith on a show discussing Jason Kenney's leadership review, where she seems to have a very different perspective. She seems pretty clearly in agreement with the speaker. Just watch. Danielle Smith's under serious threat as a leader, and she should be. She is a nightmare. She is so much more interested in culture war nonsense than she is in the business of helping Albertans, she has completely undermined her own cause. So if you're a UCP voter and watching this, which feels unlikely, remember, you have a chance to get rid of Danielle Smith. I literally cannot imagine a way you could do worse. Like, maybe the mayor of Gotham City. Maybe. Depends on the mayor. I want to take some time today to go through one of the most damning reports I've ever seen in my life. It paints a picture of an education sector that is in a state of crisis beyond our worst imaginings. It's from a research study through the University of Ottawa called Beyond the Breaking Point, Violence Against Saskatchewan's Education Sector Workers. And I want to take some time to go through it because it is terrifying. Came out this week and I can't stop thinking about it. So this was a survey that looked at 828 Saskatchewan educators. 55% of them were teachers, 35% were direct support staff, 10% were indirect support staff. And the majority of people studied were experienced workers, the majority were above the age of 40, and the average number of working years in the education sector was 14 and a half. And the rates of violence experienced by these educators is unreal. 69% of respondents experienced at least one act of physical force from a student. One in five reported more than 20 unique acts of violence. And that's just in one school year. Three quarters experienced an attempt of physical force from a student. 67% experienced a threat of physical force from a student. And one in four reported more than 20 attempts of physical force from a student. The average educator experienced 19.8 unique instances of acts, attempts, and or threats of physical force during the 2022-2023 school year. And one in five reported a threat of physical force from a parent. And this violence is becoming increasingly normalized. Educators reported that administrators and supervisors minimized the issues that were brought forward at horrifying rates. 39% felt that their experiences were often, very often, or always minimized. And 37% said that that happened sometimes. 85% of workers witnessed at least one student initiate an act of physical force against a coworker, And one in three witnessed at least one parent initiate a violent act. Violence in our schools has become normalized. And it's not just physical violence, it's also harassment. Seven out of every eight education workers experienced harassment, either from parents, students, colleagues, or administrators. 78% of educators reported one or more instances of harassment from a student. And one in six participants reported at least one instance of sexual harassment from a student including inappropriate sexual remarks, threats, and attempts. And harassment is most pronounced from parents. 
73% of teachers experienced harassment from parents at least once in the 2022-2023 school year. On average, they had seven and a half unique instances. And the most common versions of this were attacks on the teacher's competence with things like aggressive emails, accusatory interactions, public statements, and denigrating social media posts. And the study also found that current measures being taken are not sufficient. 61% of participants said that actions taken to deal with violence are ineffective, and 62% found that the actions taken while dealing with harassment were ineffective. And a big part of why that is is because people didn't feel like they're going to get supported. The research is very clear. Teachers feel like they're going to be judged, mocked, or belittled, and more. And so they just don't report it. 64% of participants indicated at least one instance of violence or harassment that should have been reported, but wasn't. These are severely underreported, and part of that's just fear of reprisal. And it's having massive impacts. People are leaving the profession at historic rates. Teachers in the survey reported leaving due to PTSD, due to massive health complications, and more. And 85% of respondents reported that workplace impacts their mental health at least somewhat or a lot. And 78% reported that harassment affected their mental health. And I've personally experienced this. I've had parents harass me in significant ways. I've been tracked down at home, screamed on the phone, threatened, had parents show up at the school, had frivolous complaints brought towards me. All manner of stuff. Teachers are an easy target, and it's caused them to suffer. 60% of teachers found that it negatively affected their personal relationships. 80% found that it affected their ability to do their job. And I want to be really clear here. The reasons for this are complicated and multifaceted. And yes, administrators aren't doing enough, but it's not out of malice. In most cases, because they're overwhelmed, overworked, they're drowning too. Schools are underfunded, undersupported. This isn't the fault of kids. It isn't the fault of teachers. It is the fault of a failing system, and we need to address it as such. There were already cracks in the education system. The impacts of COVID have simply accelerated it. 46% of participants noticed the severity and frequency of violence have increased during the pandemic and since. Over 90% of respondents found that they need to spend more time managing students' behaviors and emotions since 2020. This is an emergency. And it's from policy. Nationally, since 2012, the average funding per student has increased by 24.9%. In Saskatchewan, 3.4%. Adjusted for inflation, it's been cut by 11.6% per student. Needs continue to rise and supports fall. It's very predictable what's going to happen. Of course people are lashing out. What else are they going to do? And education workers are the ones bearing the brunt. This is a crisis that needs immediate attention from the Saskatchewan government. But Scott Moe and the SAS party have made it very clear they don't care. During the last round of bargaining, the STF had to fight to the nail just to get statistics around violence. Just to find out how much it was happening. This is the government's responsibility and they want nothing to do with it. But, good news. Saskatchewan's got a chance to vote them out this October. It's time, folks. And now for this week's rant. We really need to stop both sides the problems in our political system. Like, yeah, every side sucks, but the ways in which the different sides suck is not equal. Question period's a mess, yes, but we can't act like the blame for that lies entirely on the liberals. They're acting terrible in a way that politicians have acted terrible for as long as Canadian politics have existed. They're dodging questions in the classic ways. But the conservatives have pivoted to the hard sloganeering, self-repetition, clip harvesting, and more that has degraded the whole institution. And the same thing happens with the both sidesing of media. The conservatives treat the entire media like it's their enemy, but they'll only talk to friendly media. Pierre Poilier was basically blacklisted CTV from talking to him or any conservatives because of an editing issue with one of their videos. And I want to be really clear, the video was misleading and the people responsible for that edit had been fired. So what would it take to satisfy them? But more than that, if misleading edits are disqualifying, then surely they're never going to speak to the Rebel or the Western Standard or any of the other more questionable outlets, right? Like, the Rebel just failed to qualify for a journalism tax credit, so clearly he's going to stop talking to him. Or is he only going to hold that standard for the outlets that he dislikes, like CBC and CTV? Same with his questions about government funding. He constantly attacks the government-funded media, but Post Media openly shared that government subsidies are central to their business model. And yet, Pierre Poilievre seems to be as big a fan as ever of Post Media. And they'll predictably endorse him, because Post Media has endorsed conservatives basically since they've existed. But the way that I want to draw your attention to the both sidesing today is about bots. You see, we've known that bots are a problem for years, and if you hang out in my comment sections, you know it and get ugly in there. Lots of people just yelling PP for PM. So here's the thing. The Foreign Interference Inquiry is actually looking into the number of bots and their activity and who they're favoring. Take a wild guess. If you guess the conservatives, you're good at this game. Reddit user 150C Vapor shared this chart, showing just how significant the bot activity skews in favor of the conservatives. And I want to be really clear, there's no evidence to suggest the conservatives are coordinating with this, but it does appear that whoever's operating these bots is directly aligning with the interests of the conservative party. Does that mean someone's coordinating with them? 
maybe, but it's also possible that it's a case like what we saw with the tenant media indictment, where some people just didn't know that they were being manipulated. And the Russian government's plan was essentially just to sow chaos and discord. They didn't really care about which side won, they just wanted to make trouble. And the conservatives have been a convenient target because they're very eager to embrace the support, and they're eager to be lied to. And if you genuinely believe that the bots are not disproportionately favoring Pierre Poiliev, I defy you to go on Twitter and say something nice about Justin Trudeau. It's like farting in church. Everybody freaks out. And this is really what it comes down to. Canadian politics have gotten incredibly toxic, but the poison is coming from one place. In fact, it's really coming from one man, Pierre Poiliev. He is a singularly toxic politician who's bringing an American style to Canadian politics. He refuses to take positions on anything, it's just endless slogans and more. He's here for the camera time. He wants the media attention and he wants to sit in the big chair. He doesn't really care about ordinary Canadians and we need to stop treating him like his ills are somehow equivalent to Justin Trudeau's. Like Justin Trudeau is not a great politician. He frustrates me immensely. But Pierre Polyev is a singular kind of terrible and we need to make sure that he does not become prime minister. And that's our show for this week, folks. Thanks as always for watching, with one final and absolutely amazing political flow. You see, UK Prime Minister Keir Starmer was giving a speech and repeating the common refrain, free the hostages. Except it didn't quite come out like that. Let's have a watch. Immediate ceasefire in Gaza. The return of the sausages. The hostages. One of his more delicious errors. And on that note, thanks as always for watching, and a massive thank you to my YouTube members and patrons because I couldn't do this show without them. And as always, please remember to force your loved ones to watch the show against their will. I'd suggest bribery. You'd be surprised how far a box of Girl Scout cookies can get you. Take care of yourselves, folks.